Hello everyone, today we're doing one of my favorite things, meal prepping. We're gonna do a really easy, healthy vegan meal prep for the winter. We're using just eight basic everyday ingredients. We're going to prep them in a few different ways so we can mix and match them and have a bunch of different meals throughout the week. And best of all, it takes just a couple of hours on a Sunday afternoon. The reason I meal prep this particular way instead of making one big batch of the same recipe and eating it every single day is that I hate eating the same food every single day. It gets very boring and I'm sure a lot of you agree. So what I do instead is I meal prep several different types of ingredients like wholesome grains and plant proteins and condiments and sauces and vegetables. And then I mix and match them in different combinations so I can eat something new every single day. I take meal prep pretty seriously. So I have three requirements for my ideal meal prep. One, it shouldn't take more than two hours to do the actual cooking. Two, you should be able to use each ingredient in at least two different ways so you have variety. And three, you should be able to multitask and cook different ingredients at the same time. The eight main ingredients we'll be meal prepping today are butternut squash, Brussels sprouts, tofu, wild rice, almonds, white beans, kale, and apples. And we'll use a combination of the oven, stovetop, instant pot, and blender to get our meal prep done. I like to start my meal prep with the ingredients that take the longest to cook, the butternut squash, Brussels sprouts, and tofu, which can all be baked in the oven at the same time at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. Since this is a winter meal prep for the vegetables, we've got butternut squash and Brussels sprouts, which are two of my seasonal favorites. We'll bake all of those together in the oven at the same temperature so you can save time and work on other things in the meantime. For the tofu, you wanna make sure you're using extra firm tofu that's the best variety when you're frying it or baking it or grilling it and you do need to press out the excess water because if you don't your tofu will be watery which is not great for the texture or the taste and while the tofu is being pressed I'll get started on prepping the veggies. For the Brussels sprouts wash them thoroughly and then remove any tough outer layers especially any that are browned. Make sure you dry them thoroughly so they're not waterlogged or soggy. Slice off the thick part at the bottom and then cut each in half or in quarters if they're large. And then all we'll do is line a baking sheet with parchment paper and toss the sprouts with a bit of olive oil or avocado oil and a generous amount of salt and pepper. They don't need much more than that. You could also do this in a separate bowl and then transfer it to the parchment paper, but I'm feeling a bit lazy. So I'm just gonna do it all in the pan. I left some of the leaves that fell off on here because those parts will get really crispy. And for the butternut squash, we're gonna cut it in half. You do need a sharp knife for this one. Use a slow rocking motion. And if it's still too difficult for you to cut in half, just pop it in the microwave for a couple minutes. It'll soften it up and make it a lot easier to cut. Once you've cut the butternut squash in half, you'll scoop out the seeds. Then I'm gonna add the squash directly to the baking tray. You might need to just move things around a little bit to make it fit. I think this will work. And I'm just gonna brush a little bit of avocado oil right on the flesh. You don't need too much, just a very light coating. And again, of course, some salt. Freshly cracked black pepper. To give the squash a little more flavor, I'm just gonna add some fresh thyme leaves. I just strip down the stem to get the leaves off. It's really simple. And of course, if you don't have fresh thyme, you could also use dried thyme. The Brussels sprouts need 20 to 30 minutes and the squash needs 60 to 70 minutes, both at 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is kind of a bonus ingredient. We're also gonna add some garlic. Garlic adds flavor to everything. It's one of my most commonly used ingredients. All we're gonna do is slice off a little bit of the top of the garlic head so that the cloves are exposed rub it with a little bit of olive oil and roast it in the oven. The traditional method involves wrapping the garlic in aluminum foil, but if you don't wanna expose your food directly to foil, what I do is I wrap it in parchment paper and then in aluminum foil. We'll put the garlic on the same baking trays as the vegetables and once it's done roasting, the cloves will be really soft and caramelized and gooey and it'll be really good and super versatile. Once the tofu is done being pressed, you'll cut it into cubes. I just realized I had a third block of extra firm tofu sitting in my freezer. So I'm just gonna go ahead and chop that up too. So that means I have 24 ounces of tofu. Now that we have our tofu cut into cubes, I'm gonna make a quick little marinade. We have some tamari, which is gluten-free soy sauce. Keep in mind that if you're using regular soy sauce, it is not gluten-free. Half of the oil is gonna be a neutral avocado oil and the other half is this toasted sesame oil. It has such a rich, nutty flavor and aroma. And finally, just some crushed red pepper flakes. If you're very sensitive to spicy food, you can just omit this part. It's easier to put the tofu in a bowl first, then pour the marinade on top, so you're less likely to squish the tofu, but I accidentally did it in the wrong order. 
Now we're gonna add the arrowroot powder and this is gonna help give a slightly crispy coating to the outside. And then just gently transfer the coated tofu to a parchment paper lined baking tray. Make sure you give them a little bit of room so they're not overlapping, otherwise they'll just steam instead of getting a little bit crispy. All right, these are gonna go in the oven at 400 degrees Fahrenheit for about 25 minutes. The Brussels sprouts will be done a lot sooner than the squash, so if you wanted, you could do them on separate baking trays, but since I wanted to get everything done at once, I put them on the same baking tray. So I'll go ahead and put the squash back in the oven now. These Brussels sprouts are really good on their own, but while they're still hot, I do like to add a little bit of flaky sea salt on top and some lemon zest and lemon juice. I could probably eat this whole bowl of Brussels sprouts by myself, so if you wanna double or even triple the recipe, feel free to do so. But just keep in mind, you probably won't fit everything in your oven, unless of course you have a really giant oven or two ovens. Our tofu is done and it is perfectly golden brown. These are perfect for any kind of meal you wanna add a protein to, and I'll show you a few different options. Our butternut squash is also done. It does collect a bit of water in these cavities, so you just wanna go ahead and drain that. You know the squash is done when it's fork tender, you can easily pierce it with a fork. The garlic is also done roasting, and if you wrapped it in parchment paper first like I did, it will need more time than if you just use foil. While the veggies and tofu are roasting, we'll make the wild rice and white beans. Next up, we're gonna make our wild rice and white beans at the same time using either an instant pot or the stove. And if you're using canned beans, you can go ahead and skip this step because you don't need to cook canned beans. I'm gonna use both of my trusty Instant Pots. I do have two because I wrote a vegan Instant Pot cookbook, so I had a lot of recipes to test. But if you don't have two, which is probably most of you, I recommend using the Instant Pot for the beans and the stove top for the wild rice. And if you don't have an Instant Pot at all, you can just use the stove top for both. And I've included instructions for both methods in the free PDF guide, which you can find in the description box. I'm using one cup of wild rice, which makes about three cups cooked rice. And if you're feeding more people, feel free to double the amount. For one cup of wild rice in the Instant Pot, you need one and a half cups of water. Secure the lid and select the pressure cook setting at a high pressure for 25 minutes. Once it's done cooking, allow a natural pressure release for 10 minutes. You can, of course, make the wild rice on the stove, and for one cup rice, you'll need three cups water. Bring the mixture to a boil, then reduce the heat and cover the pan, and simmer for 40 to 50 minutes or until the rice kernels have burst open. For the wild rice, you can serve it as is, but to give it a little extra flavor because it can be a bit earthy, I'm gonna make a wild rice salad using just some basic pantry ingredients. To the wild rice, I add a bit of good balsamic vinegar, extra virgin olive oil, salt and pepper, and some dried fruits such as cranberries, cherries, or apricots, which balance the earthiness of the rice, some nuts or seeds such as pumpkin seeds, and finally some fresh herbs like cilantro, mint, and parsley, which brighten up the rice. This wild rice salad makes a great side dish for any kind of protein, or it can be the base of a grain bowl, or you can also stuff it into one of the butternut squash halves we roasted. And while the rice is cooking, we'll also cook our cannellini beans. If you're making dried beans on the stovetop, you do need to soak them overnight in plenty of cold water. And if you're using the Instant Pot, you don't have to soak your beans, but I prefer to soak them for better digestion and because it reduces the cook time, so it makes meal prep faster. To cook the dried cannellini beans in your Instant Pot, you'll need six cups of water to go with one pound of soaked beans. And it's really important to add salt to your cooking water so that it flavors the beans from within. You can cook the beans plain like this, but I like to add a little bit of flavoring to make them extra special. I'm gonna use some freshly cracked black pepper, some garlic cloves, I've got about four of them. And then I've got this bouquet garni. I've just got some thyme and sage here today. I've tied it up with kitchen twine so that it's easy to fish out at the end. And you can also use dried herbs if you prefer. For soaked cannellini beans, you need just five to eight minutes in the Instant Pot. For unsoaked beans, you need 35 to 40 minutes. And for the stovetop method, refer to the PDF guide. Rinse the cooked beans and once they're cooled, you can store them in the fridge, but we're also gonna use them to make two condiments. First, white bean hummus. Since white beans are so creamy, this hummus is gonna be creamier and smoother than your classic chickpea hummus. We've got white beans, kosher salt, fresh garlic, and lemon juice, and of course, a generous amount of tahini and cumin. And with the motor running, drizzle in a few spoons of ice water. I like to use the hummus as a condiment for almost any savory food, as a spread for sandwiches, or paired with veggies for a snack. The second condiment we're making is a winter mash, also using the cannellini beans, as well as one half of that butternut squash we roasted. We're also adding the roasted garlic, which will make it really flavorful, and some salt and pepper. This mash makes a great dip or condiment for savory food, and it's delicious as is, but for a bit more flavor and richness, drizzle in some extra virgin olive oil. And while the beans and rice are cooking, we'll start on the almond butter, kale, and apples. 
Next up, we're gonna make some almond butter using some raw almonds. This is about four cups of raw almonds, but if you have some extra nuts, you can toast them along with these and then use them for salad toppers or as snacks throughout the week. First, we'll toast them in the oven. It tastes a lot better that way because it enhances the flavor, it gives that nice little toasty flavor. To start, spread the four cups of almonds out on a baking tray or half sheet pan and toast in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 10 to 12 minutes until they're toasty and fragrant. Allow them to cool before making the almond butter. And I'm using my Vitamix to make it because it takes just one minute to make almond butter. You do need to use the tamper to continuously push the almonds around. And if you don't have a Vitamix, you can just use a food processor. It will take a bit longer, anywhere from five to 15 minutes. While I certainly love being able to buy almond butter at the store when I need it, this is the thickest and richest almond butter I've ever tried, so it feels more satisfying. You can store it in the fridge for up to two weeks. Next up, we have some kale that we're going to meal prep. We're gonna do it in two different ways. And if you've seen some of my other videos, you're probably thinking, this girl eats a lot of kale. And it's true, I do really like kale, but the other reason I like using kale in meal prep is that it is a sturdy, hearty green. Unlike, say, spinach or arugula, it will stay good in the fridge for a week. It won't wilt. And unlike other sturdy greens like collard greens or Swiss chard, you can eat kale raw, so you get the best of both worlds. Start by stripping the kale of its tough stems and then wash the leaves under cold water. For the raw kale, I like to massage it with a bit of extra virgin olive oil. It helps break down the kale's toughness, makes it easier to digest, and it makes for better tasting salads. If you don't wanna use oil, you can massage it with lemon juice. And even if you don't massage the kale, be sure to chop it pretty finely as it makes it easier to chew in salads. I store the massaged kale in an airtight container or one of these reusable silicone bags in the fridge for five to seven days. If you're trying to reduce your plastic usage and are interested in these bags, I've left a link in the description box. Now for the cooked kale. I heat up a large nonstick pan and then add some raw kale directly to it. Let it cook for a few minutes and then pour in a bit of water. Cover and steam for about five minutes until tender but still green. This steam saute method is really simple, but to add more flavor, feel free to saute the kale in olive oil, garlic, and seasonings. Most of the food we prepped today will be perfect for lunch or dinner, but I didn't forget breakfast snacks and desserts. First, we have the almond butter, which obviously you can use on toast in the morning with some fruit or as an afternoon snack with some rice cakes. You can also put it in your morning oatmeal. You can put a spoon or two in your morning smoothie for some healthy fats. You can also spread it with some bananas or apples or pears for an afternoon snack. And another ingredient you can use for breakfast or dessert are apples. And of course, when you go to the grocery store, pick up a few extras so you can just snack on them whole. But what I really like to do is make some cinnamon maple apples. I've got six crisp organic apples. I'm using Fuji apples because they're firm enough that they won't get soggy when cooked. Peel the apples and you can use the leftover peels to make apple cinnamon tea or add them to a smoothie. And then you'll chop them up into a large dice. I like to make this during winter when there aren't that many fruits in season and I usually have a ton of apples in my fridge. Heat up a large nonstick pan with some water, then add the apples along with some cinnamon and spices and a splash of maple syrup. If you're avoiding added sugar or using a very sweet variety of apples, feel free to omit the syrup. Cook the apples for about 10 minutes until they're soft and fork tender, but not mushy. I love spooning these apples over a warm bowl of oatmeal in the winter for a cozy treat, or you could stuff them in a sweet potato with the almond butter, or for dessert, you could serve them over a vegan vanilla ice cream. Now that the meal prep is over, let's talk about how you can combine some of these ingredients to make mix and match meals throughout the week. So we are gonna do a grain bowl, which is basically use the wild rice as a grain base. And of course, if you don't like wild rice, if it's too earthy for you, for instance, you can substitute it with brown rice or a different grain like quinoa or millet. There are multiple grain bowl combos you can make. This one has plain wild rice, the roasted Brussels sprouts, some baked tofu, and the white bean hummus to bring it all together. And I top it with a few staple ingredients I keep on hand, such as fresh herbs and sesame seeds. A slightly different grain bowl option is to use the white beans as the protein source, the kale as the vegetable, and then add both the winter mash and the white bean hummus and mix it in. I like to add some avocado to this meal for a healthy fat source. Another meal idea that's a great lunch is a stuffed pita. I spread both the winter mash and the white bean hummus into whole wheat pita pockets, stuff it with some of the massaged kale, and then add a generous amount of the cannellini beans, and I like to finish it with fresh cilantro and parsley, tahini, and red pepper flakes. 
This next concept is a balanced plate. So we have complex carbs from the wild rice salad, cruciferous veggies from the sprouts, protein from the tofu, leafy greens from the massaged kale, and to top it off, the winter mash. If you have some extra ingredients in your pantry, you can also add crushed walnuts and a drizzle of tahini. You can also use the hummus and the winter mash as sandwich spreads instead of something like mayo. This is an open-faced sandwich with the winter mash, some massaged kale on top, thinly sliced tofu, and some sriracha. There is a free PDF guide that goes along with this video to help you meal prep this winter. And to master your vegan meal prep even more, be sure to check out this short little playlist I made for you guys. Thanks so much for watching. Okay, bye.